chairs for the second half of the session on technology and innovation. We will ask our friends to come back, the friends from the first session, so that we can answer some of the questions that you kindly send to us. And then, of course, we'll have questions for the second part of the session as well. Before we get underway with Narges and her expanded panel, it's my pleasure to, first of all, thank Smith Detection for the networking coffee break just a few moments ago. And we have the pleasure of a presentation by Smith's Detection. It will be made by Mr. Tony Thielen. Now, Tony joined Smith's Detection in May 2015, I should say, and is now Vice President Europe, Africa, and Marketing. And he joined the organization in 2015. It's a pleasure, Tony, and we're looking for a great presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Denis, for uh, doing the introduction. And uh, thank you to all the members uh, here, as well as on the live stream, uh, for the opportunity for Smith's Detection to uh, uh, give the presentation. So what we're about to do, uh, what I would like to do is actually talk to you about how technology could provide the platform for the innovation that you're striving for as regulatory bodies around the world. Before I go there, um, I won't talk about Smith's detection. I think most of you know the company. We detect threats uh, in different shapes and forms, be it explosives, chemicals, biological or nuclear. But what I would like to call out is that for us as a company, uh, looking for talent, there is a war of talent out there for us as a company. We're actually very proud to be part of this ecosystem where we all make the world a safer place. And it might sound simple, but in today's market, where we're looking for millennials, where we're looking for new people, where we talk software, artificial intelligence, having a mission to make the world a safer place is giving us so much more edge than many of the other uh, industries that are looking for the same talent as well. I just wanted to share that with you because you're part of the same ecosystem and maybe sometimes uh, we don't stand back and think about it, but it's a great thing uh, to be part of. So what we do is we actually operate in a field where we need to meet different needs. So on the one side, we have evolving threats. These evolving threats with new threats being found, uh, unfortunately, but it is what it is, every year, and the shape or form of those threats changing as well. Right? From, from solids to powders to vapor, different threats, chemical agents, unfortunately, coming back up again, means that as a technology provider, we continuously need to develop new technologies. But that's not the only point, because in that same ecosystem, when we talk about aviation, we have airlines that are actually asking for better customer experience. We see, we see a space where we have more and more privatization, private airports, private airlines, where actually there is also a commercial drive to make sure that the screening process that passengers go through actually allow those airlines to differentiate from others. So, that puts a lot of pressures on the airports at the end because they have on the one side to deal with increased regulatory requirements, whereas on the other side, they actually have to deal with airports. Okay. There is something wrong with the translation. That's what I, what I pick up here. The Russian translation, please. Okay. I, I get there is no translation. Okay, so excuse me, there is no uh, translation for the, uh, for the Sky Talk. Okay, good. Apologies for that. So on the one side, we have uh, uh, the regulatory requirements for the evolving threats. On the other side, we have the uh, requirements from airlines and passengers themselves to have a seamless and, a, and most efficient and a good experience as a passenger, as a customer. 
And then on the third side, we have airports that actually need to accommodate both. And in the world where we play as technology provider, we actually take the input from yourself as regulators in terms of what we need to detect, but we deal with airports that actually come to us with different needs as well, particularly around how can you as a te technology provider make that experience as efficient as possible. Bringing those needs together actually means that we need to come up with new venues, and that's actually where digital software and other capabilities now start playing a role. So digital is making its way into safety. In terms of constraints, uh, we do see continuous growth, but airports have a limited real estate where they can work with. So if we want to continue the growth, we need to make sure that we allow airports to have more of their passengers going through their existing environment, their existing constructions. I already talked to the evolving threats leading to uh, ever-evolving regulatory requirements, whether we talk about passengers or cargo. I talked about the operational uh, performance, um, not only from a pure commercial point of view, so how can we at lower cost actually screen passengers. In, in many jurisdictions, there is also a need uh, for, lower, uh, for less operators because they don't have the talent or they don't have the people available that can actually uh, uh, provide the operations. Finally, whereas before the measure around the passenger journey was very much from how quickly can you get uh, passengers through security into airplanes, we see a move there as well, and, and what we use internally is we say we see actually all the security checkpoints slowly transforming into Apple i stores or something that looks like it. It all needs to look uh, nice. The process needs to be swiftly with as little as possible touch points. So we need to bring that together. I have a bit of a sour throat, so allow me uh, some water. So we need to bring that together, and why now is what I would say. Now, the reason why now is that through your work, actually policies allow more and more innovation, and policies also allow uh, innovation as well as differentiation of screening throughout the passenger journey. And at the same time, the technology is ready to provide a platform to do so. So what you see here in a very uh, graphical way, actually information that we obtain from different sources and that gets obtained under the regulatory umbrella of any departing airport, could be shared and if so, if shared, could be used by other airports in the same passenger journey. So there are benefits for transit airports to actually use security information coming from the departure airport. And there are benefits, obviously, also for the destination airport to do the same. Because those airports could be working on the different regulatory requirements and could be handling needs from different stakeholders. They will be able to do so using their own existing infrastructure. So no specific infrastructure for a specific destination anymore one infrastructure that actually handles the different requirements. So we call that uh, risk-based screening. And the essence for us for risk-based screening is, is by using the different uh, information that gets gathered through the passenger journey to actually allow authorities operating in airports to focus their efforts on the few people, the few passengers that need added attention, and actually not having to do so much work on all the other passengers. Purely by reusing information that has been gathered throughout the journey itself. So, here is a, a very simple example, uh, just to make it very practical as well, where actually screening information that has been obtained in a, de a departure airport, coupled with the destination information, 
could actually be used in the arrival airport as well. And since we're talking about rich data, which means we're not talking about simple images, we're talking about images that contain all the information that you get from a screening system, actually the arrival airport can, while the plane is in the air, actually start looking at information and actually not only by operators but also by added technology like artificial intelligence for example look for the threats that are specific to the arrival airport it's the same data the data is nothing different than when having a screening system available for incoming flights but in this case almost similar to going to a doctor, why would you actually take two or three or four X-ray images going from one doctor to the other if you could actually reuse the data that has been obtained already? I come back to this later because we are working with airports that are exactly venturing into this and they do that from different angles. So operationally, it's beneficial for an airport, but you could also see from a regulatory framework, if you operate in, a, in an arrival in a destination country under a different framework, having access to the screening data in advance could mean you could look for your threats before the uh, uh, airplane has even landed to actually sift through the material, uh, sift through the information and make the right uh, risk-based decisions. So, Airlines, uh, authorities, but also airports actually talk about the passenger journey. And here you see uh, a simple graphic approach to the passenger journey. And what we are saying is, is actually we're augmenting that uh, with the associated data journey. Now, I'm not pleading for a situation where you might think that we do, uh, we handle a lot of passenger or privacy related information. Actually, we ourselves don't do anything with the data itself. What we do is we provide a platform that actually allocates risk information to individual passengers and allow that risk information to be used throughout the journey in its raw form, meaning every stakeholder or every authority could actually look at the information for their specific needs. The way to do that is to make sure that throughout you have the right sensors in place, of course, and that you'll have a number of companies, not just our company as Smith's Detection, but other companies as well, that will talk to you about how those sensors are continuously being upgraded to get new threats. What we are saying the next step now is to actually use biometrics or use some other examples uh, of technology that can then actually marry the threat information to the passenger and carry it through the whole passenger journey from departure to arrival. And this is a simple graphical example, whereas different stakeholders and different authorities could actually look for different threats. So a departure airport would typically look for explosives, whether explosives are being put on the plane or not. But actually a uh, arrival or a transit airport could look for other items in the same data, uh, potentially narcotics, weapons, or other, other elements. So this is a very simple example where it applies to cargo. For us as a technology company, the um, cargo applications and driving those forward have been a bit simpler than passenger information. This is all related to the previous discussion around how as authorities do you handle uh, privacy-related information. In cargo, that's less of a relevance. And actually what you see there is that combining information, in this case, 
consignment, sender information, destination information, how are the packages traveling, together with screening information, allows a risk-based screening system to actually uh, 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 make decisions around whether there is a potential threat or not. So decision-based screening, where actually the operating stakeholders decide what to do, but the underlying system actually looks in big data uh, whether there is a potential threat or not. So it's very much also about fusing different types of information together. So that gets me to kind of forward looking and where we think technology could bring the, uh, uh, the uh, industry and where, how technology could support regulation and vice versa. So the first bullet is actually to make sure that what, we what I try to present you and bring forward is not pie in the sky, as you would say in English, but is very much something which is here and now. So we are in discussion with a number of airports, most notably in, uh, in the United States, in the Middle East, and in, uh, in Europe, around sharing the images and data. The biometrics element is uh, relevant to actually allocate data from, for example, cabin baggage to the right passenger. So that not only hold baggage information, but also cabin baggage information can be shared. Now, for airports, there is a big operational benefit to this as well, which is why they're so keen to enter in these discussions. Because instead of having to handle um, uh, a burst of flights all coming in around the same time, sharing of information actually allows them to uh, peak shave their workload and make their workload far more stable. Uh, and actually take the time for a flight, which could take anywhere between six and 10 hours, to uh, look at the data and actually screen it for incoming or for transit passengers. Particularly for transit, there is a lot of request and demand, so I2D, international to domestic, because another aspect that uh, airports are dealing with is getting the baggage quickly from the arriving uh, airplane to the domestic departing airplanes is an issue, and very regularly a lot of baggage gets lost, which is a cost to the airline. So actually taking the work out and only do secondary screening on those uh, uh, passengers and on that baggage that's needed is helping a lot there as well. It gets me to the third bullet before I come to the second bullet. Those uh, discussions are done together with the regulators. So TSA, CBP, uh, DFT are all involved. And it's also an appeal for me to you, uh, having the opportunity to speak to you all here and sharing with you what technology can do. It's actually work with the industry to how we can implement these concepts uh, practically and how we can get around some of the, the practical issues that we have when it comes to sharing information across borders. But in all those uh, discussions and proof of concepts that we're working on, we have the regulators tied in from the beginning, with the airports being the major driving factors behind this. So we do have uh, those plans to uh, deploy the proof of concept, and as I said, uh, when it comes to cargo, when there are uh, no passengers and no people information involved, those go a bit quicker. Uh, but we're also moving ahead with true passenger on very bespoke connections between two airports with the associated regulators. The benefits that we derive from that, from a pure security point of view, is that every government, every authority can use the same set of data for their own benefit, for the threats or for their own information they're looking for. From an operations point of view, it's the airports that see a lot of benefits in actually handling based on information at the time they can, way in advance of the actual arrival of, uh, of airplanes, and not having to continue to invest in big machinery for which they don't have place anyway in most cases. 
And for the passenger, it makes the whole journey far more seamless as well. So instead of having to go through security checkpoints on a continuous basis during a trip, I came in via New York, uh, three different airports, three different experiences, I would say, when it comes to New York. Um, for passengers, this will, this will become far less intrusive and far more seamless as well. So we do see the drivers pointed in the right direction. And therefore, my appeal to you to, to work with the industry to let innovation have its, play its role and get us to the uh, uh, next stage in terms of inflection for this industry. I thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for a very timely and supportive presentation of the discussions we're having today. We'll take a minute or two to set up the stage, and I would invite at this point the panel members for session number two, or the second half of our session this afternoon, and Simon, David, and Jonathan. If you're still around, we'd like to have you on stage as well so that we can answer some of the questions that were put to the panel earlier this afternoon. So we'll take just a few seconds to set up. And maybe just a reminder of our speakers when you are using the microphones, hold it close to your mouth so we can really hear you, okay? And then at the end of the session, we'll be asking all of you to stay behind for the huge family portrait. I think this is the biggest session we've ever had or the largest number of participants. Okay. Okay, Narges, so we've been all introduced and uh, I will turn the control over to you once more. Merci. What I would like to propose before uh, moving to the second part of this session uh, is to ask some of the questions that we have received for uh, the previous session. Um, Jonathan, I would start with you. Uh, the question is, as it is, who should be the lead agency in the implementation of API PNR? Should it be the CAA or border agency? Thank you for, uh, for the question. Um, in terms of who should be the lead, um, in the current Canadian context, uh, our border agency, CBSC, is the lead agency in terms of the actual implementation uh, in terms of the current program. What I want to communicate is I think that it's, even if there's a lead agency, it's really a collaborative work and that's the key of the success of, of that, uh, of an implementation, is the work that everyone will do uh, together in a collaborative manner that will be the key to success, I think, in the implementation. But in terms of who should be the lead, I think the context is different in each country and it could be uh, different from our experience. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next question for Simon. Who should be, uh, no, sorry, that's it's already done. Um, who will use the data from API and PNR, and who should pay for the cost? Is it the passenger? So who should use the data? As we were talking in the earlier session, um, there should be some clear public law so people can understand who uses it. You should have some competent authorities. You have set purposes for why the data 
uh, why the data may be used, and you are very clear should be very clear about which authorities. So as long as an authority has a necessary requirement to make a legitimate use of the data, then so long as the law of that particular territory uh, gives them that role, then then they should be able to use it. I think uh, uh, in in terms of protection of the public from from threats of crime, I mean the use of the data should be as broad as it needs to be for proportionate purposes. I don't think anybody's suggesting that the uh, the um, car ticketing authority or the speeding authority necessarily should use pers passenger name record data. In terms of who should pay for the cost, clearly there are costs involved, and those will fall either to taxpayers or passengers. It's you know it's it's no there's no shirking uh, the answer to that question. It will fall upon members of the public ultimately, either as taxpayers or as passengers. I think the important thing is that from an industry perspective, there needs to be something that it gets in return for participating and supporting the provision of data. Uh, some of that might be in terms of providing additional opportunities to carry individuals who might, to not carry individuals who they may incur additional cost in removing from a territory. So by processing of data, a carrier gets that benefit. Carriers being able to know who is going to be admissible to the territory they're carrying them. So there needs to be something in it for carriers to engage them and want to participate. And one of the things that uh, a carrier would wish to get as a benefit should be that its customers also get benefit. So by providing your data, by your data being processed, you should get a better facilitation. So you're, you're paying for something. That's the important point, that the, mm -hmm. the passenger or the taxpayer is paying for something, but they're getting something in return. They either get a better facilitation or they get better security. Okay, thank you, Simon. So this means that it is in line with the ICAO policies because uh, it is not considered as a tax at that time. It is considered as a charge because it is corresponding to a service. That's what uh, uh, is behind that. Uh, my uh, um, my last question is uh, for David. Uh, how does the United States provide assistance to states around the world on API and a PNR? So we do so in an, a number of ways. Uh, one of which is uh, by which we provide um, advice and guidance on our on the U.S. experience. Uh, we we hold um, uh, we frequently participate in fora such as this one, um, but at others that are sponsored by the United Nations or uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, immigration uh, the. the um, the IOM, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, and and other international organizations, uh, multilateral organizations that have an interest in border security, and and the um, and the movement of, of the facilitation of, of people across borders. We also provide an, an application to governments that are interested in partnering with the United States. It is um, it is a not only as a system, but it is also a means of capacity building by which we share um, legis examples of legislation. Uh, we provide assistance in working with uh, data service providers. Uh, we provide training in using API and PNR data, not only on a day-to-day -day basis against uh, against watch lists, but also to identify uh, people who were previously unknown to uh, to law enforcement and intelligence. And we, we share our methodologies, we share our, our mechanisms, we also share um, share information with our partners um, by exchanging information, exchanging API and PNR information on risks that are deemed of mutual interest for both for both governments. Thank you, David. Um, just very quickly, I would like to mention uh, two comments, I would say. Uh, one stating that the polls are quoted in percentage terms, but with the results from each answer combined, much greater than 100, they are not therefore percentage units. 
but the ratio. So can they be adjusted to percentage so you can have a clearer visibility to the data if possible? So that's uh, a comment. It is not, uh, unless you have uh, an answer for that. Uh, and finally, uh, even if we speed the boarding gate document review and with biometrics, passengers need to go through the process of seating, placing overhead bags, which no technology will replace this process. Basically, can biometric investments justify the cost if boarding process will reach its maximum speed? Is this, are these addressed to me? Um, not really. <laughs> if you want, you can, uh, you can answer. <laughs> I, I agree that, that the boarding process is, is difficult and there are many different variables that are involved. But I, I think that's what we how we should see API and PNR and biometrics for that matter. They are not going to solve all of the problems. They're not going to create a zero uh, a, a situation in which uh, there will be zero time to board an aircraft. They help with the boarding of aircraft. They help with the screening and vetting of travelers. They assist in reducing the amount of time that governments need to interface or interact with people crossing borders, but they don't entirely replace the processes. They are a means by which governments can use to expedite the processing of travelers, but the processing of travelers still must occur. Thank you, David. I think that we, we, can, th we can thank Jonathan, Simon, and David for their uh, answers and uh, give them a, road of, uh, a round of applause. Thank you. Um, let's move now to the second part of this session. Uh, on technology and innovation, and I will introduce my first panelist, uh, Mr. Ali El Athbi, uh, Facilitation and Security Department, the Qatar Civil Aviation Authority in Qatar. So, Ali, the floor is yours to present some of your items. Uh, thank you, Anabjus. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, ICAO to give me the chance and the opportunity to uh, to, part uh, to participate in this. Uh, Okay. Okay. First, thank you for the ICAO to give me the chance and the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, aviation security uh, symposium 2019, which is focusing on the innovation solution. Uh, so uh, that uh, this is a chance to uh, to uh, uh, to share with you that my our experience for the biometric passenger travel talk in Qatar. So in preparation for the upcoming 2022 World Cup, we are expecting a big number of uh, passengers coming to Qatar. So uh, in Qatar, we uh, had taken the initiative to use the biometric passenger single travel token, which successfully uh, already registered uh, more than 1,000 passengers uh, and more than uh, five uh, biometric kiosks. And uh, using these technologies and innovation techniques uh, is important in, facilitation, in facilita uh, facilitating civil aviation and increasing security efficiency and currency. And also, uh, it's an important way to enhance the aviation security and facilitation uh, to, using, to use the modern technologies due to the data currency and the quick response. Uh, also, it, uh, give, it give a speed response, efficiency, and the choice for, for the passenger. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Our second panelist is uh, Mrs. Céline Canu. Uh, she is the head of aviation facilitation at the International Air Transport Association. Céline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Narges. And um, I feel privileged to be between the country who's going to organize the World Cup and the one who will organize the Olympic Games. Uh, I have no ticket to sell today, but um, I think that, uh, I mean, we, we've covered a, a number of points during the, the first uh, session, uh, be it, uh, and uh, we are talking today about innovation. Uh, we have to keep in mind that innovation is possible uh, whenever there is an automation of the process also and whenever the, the basic standards are, are respected. And, and if I have a, a message um, uh, to, to throw to the audience today is really that 
the message uh, and notably the messaging standards that have been created uh, for the transmission of uh, advanced passenger information and passenger name records uh, in uh, uh, jointly by the, the World Custom Organization, uh, IQ and IATA, are uh, the, the, the fundamental um, uh, standards to, to, to respect if we want to further automate the process, if you want to receive uh, data, uh, accurate data, as uh, we mentioned uh, earlier. So that brings me to uh, uh, some few points about uh, the uh, uh, some of the initiatives we uh, we have uh, uh, within IATA, but not us only, because we heard uh, from different panels. But stakeholders' uh, collaboration is uh, crucial if we want to uh, be successful. If we really want to make a difference in the passenger process, in how it is um, actually constructed. Uh, if we look at the the PNR. Um, I I don't know if it's going to be a bomb or uh, I have a little secret to, to share with you, but um, as you are regular passengers, you know that um, it's sometimes annoying you uh, when you are looking for your your ticket, you, your reservation. You don't know if you have to use a, a booking reference or a PNR number or or um, a, an e-ticket number. Uh, basically, it comes from the fact that the airline process is based also on, on legacy process, on, on the coupon, for those who, are, who, are, who knew the, the coupons in the early days. Uh, we are changing uh, this process. Uh, it's currently being trialed. So what we called, the, or we currently call the PNR, uh, will be then called something completely different. It's the order, which in fact reflects uh, what the, the, the data is meant for. It's meant to, to provide an order. What does the passenger want? They, they order a flight from a destination to another at a certain time. There are uh, financial data that are associated. So that would be uh, an enriched PNR. So don't worry. Uh, the data elements that you currently found in the PNR will still be present, uh, but it might be called differently, and, and it's part of our uh, transformation process. Uh, another important project uh, we work on with governments and airports, and um, obviously ICAO and NACI, uh, um, relies on the, um, it's called One ID, and we are looking at having this uh, one envelope with passenger identity, passenger traveling information, travel authorization, and have this um, uh, information requested from the passenger extracted only once. Um, and this information can be used then by governments, airlines, or airports. So it's not just airlines extracting this information. It could be uh, government. Um, there are few models that are evolving. And um, uh, um, um, we uh, mentioned earlier the, the TVS system in uh, in US, which is certainly uh, one of the uh, emerging models. Uh, which is very interesting for us because we see also that um, country states regain control of, of their border and um, they, uh, they act as the ID providers. So uh, those are transforming uh, transformation projects that we are running and that will uh, certainly change the face of uh, API and PNR data. Thank you, Céline. Um, our third panelist is Mr. Sho Kagawa, uh, who is Manager Aviation Security at the Security Department, Airport Operation Division of uh, the Narita International Airport Corporation in Japan. Sho, please. Madam Nages, uh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation aujourd'hui. Um, also, English and French is not my first language. So thank you, Nargis and IKO, for allowing me to participate in this um, panel discussion in the anniversary year of IKO. I'm now a little bit um, nervous because my previous boss, Nargis in IKO, is just uh, sitting next to me. So I will try my best. So today, 
I'm going to share Narita's experiences related to facilit uh, facial recognition technology later on, especially what kind of challenges, issues do we have and behind the scene, why do we implement innovation? Through my career, what I learned would be that the relationship between aviation security and facilitation is being mutually complemented day by day and year by year. As the Secretary General mentioned in the plenary session, we should balance two domains in an innovative way. I totally agree with the idea as a by word of for innovation. I think facial recognition technology is a key to balance the enhancement of aviation security and seamless passenger travel at higher level and cost effectively. In fact, it is now rapidly spreading around the world. It is great pleasure for me to be here with the distinguished experts sitting next to me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sho. I just want to confirm that uh, Sho was an outstanding, really outstanding colleague. So our fourth um, uh, panelist is Mr. Anderson Siqueira, a Brazilian customs officer from Sao Paulo International Airport in Brazil. Anderson, please. Yes, thank you very much, Nardis. Um First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a honor to be here and sharing the stage with the other other folks here, specialists. And special thanks to the ICAO staff who uh, support us during our stay here and for the warm welcome that you give us since we arrive here. Okay, so uh, I'm a customs officer. I manage the intelligence team in Sao Paulo Airport in Brazil. So. We are a busiest, uh, the busiest airport in the in the South Hemisphere. Okay, it's a big one, really big one, and it lead leads us to manage the API and PNR system uh, and share this ex experience around the world. Nowadays, we are also training for UNODC and Interpol and WCO in this matter. So. Our API and PNR system started in 2014. Uh, since there, it was a legacy from the World Cup and, to the, and also from the Olympics that we share now with Tokyo and with Qatar. Uh, and we have uh, some numbers that for us were a little bit uh, impressive. So. API and PNR lead us to manage uh, not only goods taxation in the customs, but we work side by side with the federal police. So customs and police in joint airport uh, task forces, in the especially against drugs trafficking. I don't know if you if you already learned about this or heard about this, but uh, South America and especially Brazil is a big hub of distribution and receiving drugs around the world. And I'm, I'm sad to say about this, but it's, it's true. And the question is that after we start to use the API and PNR system, our seizures in Sao Paulo airport had an increase of 300%. Oh, it means that from 2014 to uh, until 2017, São Paulo Guarulhos Airport was the number one in seizures of drugs in the airport. I mean, is the airport in the world that made more seizures in drugs casing? And this one is, is was. Uh, for me, it's, it's clear that it was uh, due to the use of API and PNR system. Okay, so my whole here is to share the experience, show how, how we developed this one, uh, what we learn from the practices, and how can we uh, help you or maybe support you, or better than this, encourage you guys to uh, 
develop your API system and not only with our help from Brazil, but with ICAO and our colleagues here. And because this one can make your daily job easily, not only for the administration, but for the passengers, for the airline companies and for the society in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anderson. So, uh, as uh, I did for for the part one of this session two, I have prepared some slides. However, I'm going to go very quickly through these slides because I, I just want to to allow uh, more time in order to be able to answer to uh, the questions from uh, from the audience. So um, this is the main challenge for facilitation. We have heard uh, that uh, many times. Uh, uh, this uh, today. Uh, we are talking only about, uh, there are of course 100,000 daily flights, but it is covering also domestic flights. But here what is interesting for us is of course uh, the international passenger. And uh, this is really uh, representing a challenge to uh, expedite the, the clearance for uh, all passengers. So uh, that's why uh, the, there is a need to use uh, technology in order to uh, expedite uh, more quickly all uh, the passengers uh, with, who are in fact uh, expected to grow. Uh, and the forecast, uh, should it be from IKEA or from IATA, are uh, very similar in terms of uh, how many uh, international passengers we are going to reach in uh, 20 years. So uh, the good news here is that uh, uh, the number of uh, airports uh, using, uh, having implemented uh, automated border control has uh, has increased and this continued to, to increase. It is now 234 airports in uh, 69 states. And uh, this is, of course, uh, a recommended practice in Annex 9 for uh, the expansion of the use of uh, ABCs uh, as a means to verify and authenticating e passport. So we have also another uh, powerful inspection system, which is uh, the ICAO public key uh, directory. And uh, the recommended practice in Annex 9 is to uh, combine, in fact, uh, the validation of the e-passport with the public key directory. So this is uh, to uh, authenticate and verify the, the e-passport, then making the, the biometric matching to uh, establish that the passenger is uh, the rightful holder of the document. Uh, query the Interpol stolen and lost travel document SLT data database, uh, as well as, of course, other border control record uh, to determine uh, eligibility for border crossing. So the combination of these three tools uh, is a recommended practice of Annex 9. Sorry. Uh, it is now a part which is uh, highly technical and uh, I am going to, to go very quickly. What is important here is to understand the technical structure of uh, what is a, a biometric uh, passport uh, because this is in fact uh, confirming in fact the secure uh, the secure of uh, this travel document and our project, which is uh, the digital travel credential uh, concept, is to maintain, in fact, uh, this uh, secure way of traveling. So uh, we, ha we know that passport is used by uh, a, a large, uh, wide range of actors, should it be uh, immigration, uh, transport, uh, air industry, etc., etc. And uh, uh, in fact, is it the, the objective of our project, the digital travel credential, uh, is to make this data accessible without the physical presentation uh, of the uh, of the passport. Uh, so we uh, are working toward these uh, specifications for this uh, DTC. Uh, this DTC now the policy has been uh, developed by an, an IKO working group, 
and uh, the specifications are now being developed in uh, close cooperation uh, with the International Organization uh, for Standardization, ISO. Uh, before developing, of course, the policy, several uh, technologies uh, have been uh, explored, uh, notably the blockchain. Uh, but finally, for uh, security reasons, uh, the model chosen was a hybrid one, uh, meaning that you still have the uh, physical token, which is the passport, and uh, the other token. So uh, you can see on the highest, higher part of the slide uh, the different persons that currently a passenger is, uh, uh, is meeting and for which he has to show uh, his uh, passport. And uh, below, on the below part of the slide, it is how the DTC is going to uh, allow the passenger to have a seamless, um, a seamless sh sorry, a travel continuum. So I think that that's it for the moment. Now uh, I would like to uh, to share with you the uh, audience poll uh, before opening the discussion with our panelists. So the poll is which passenger process could benefit the most uh, from the use of API and PNR data? First, check-in uh, and baggage drop-off. This, of course, it is uh, not exactly the use, but the collection of, uh, of, the, uh, of the data. Second, security check. Third, border control. And the fourth is boarding. So uh, please use the IKOF Sex Symposium app to answer the question. Uh, but for this question, uh, we are going to ask you that you provide one answer only. Um, so we will have some time to submit your answer before the, the end of this uh, session. And also feel free to submit uh, questions from the floor via the, teleconferen the conference app. Now um, we are going to discuss how can API and PNR processing feed into a risk assess assessment. So my first question is for Anderson. And uh, Anderson, could you please tell us more the passenger data processing system used by Brazilian customs for your risk assessment. Does Brazil use artificial intelligence to analyze PNR data? Thank you. Thank you, Nartalis. So, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, so we started to use the API PNR system in 2014, just before the World Cup that we had in Brazil. So, uh, when we, we look forward, uh, just checking like uh, 10 days uh, uh, behind, so we were a lot of uh, customs officers over there and police officers working together. And at that time, we don't have any kind of system to check the passengers to make any filters. So everything was based in our experience, in our feeling. So you have long lines of passengers arriving at the airport and you have the officers over there asking for papers, you have to fill a paper, you have to be under interview, you have to show your passport, and then you were selected for a, a check, an inspection in the x-ray machine, or no, or you are free. But uh, as a busiest airport in the South Hemisphere, as I mentioned, and this means uh, under the equator line, so, uh, in, in crowd hours, we have like 4,500 4, passengers arriving at the same time. I mean, in two hours, for example, for, from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., we have almost 9,000 passengers arriving at the same time. Uh, 
So uh, how, what, what you can do if you are the number 8,500 in the line, so you have to wait a long time. That, that was the scenario before 2014 in our airport. So after that, we implemented the API and PNR system, mandatory under the law, so all the airline companies should send the information. And, uh, and before this one, uh, especially for the World Cup, we had the requests from airlines that wants to fly to Brazil, starting the services to Brazil at that hour, and we said, no, it's impossible. We are completely full at this time. We cannot receive more flights. But nowadays, after we, we started to use the API PNR system, it's really, really easy to be controlled when you arrive over there. Since the immigration, customs control, and then you are free. So at that time, before the API, you, you can spend almost two and a half hours before being free after controls. And nowadays, our, our lead time is under 15 minutes. So this is the first benefit. And for risk assessment, so we do not control only uh, drugs trafficker, as I mentioned, but also uh, goods tax taxation, cities, that means animals under, under control, or cash smugglers, uh, whatever. And the question is that uh, with this kind of data that we receive before the passenger arrives, we just select those who will be uh, inspected, will be under search, okay? It's impossible to search all the passengers, 9,000 passengers in two hours. Can you imagine how many officers we need to do this kind of job? So uh, we feed the system that we develop ourselves in Brazil. We feed the system with all the information arriving and departing. Okay, and then with some intelligent, some artificial intelligence, we give the system some rules. Okay, and then according to these rules, there are 25 rules for each kind of check. Should be for goods taxation, for cash smugglers, for terrorism, for drug trafficking. 25 rules for each of these matters, and we give like points, okay, to each rule of these. And the system will automatically select or make a, a filter in all these passengers and, and return to us. In this flight, you have to search these and these and these passenger, A, B, and C. Or in this hour, you can select these, these, and this passenger for all those that are arriving. And for this first filter, uh, our intelligence system goes there and check then personal data and social data and other stuff, criminal records, whatever, that will lead us directly to those guys that look suspicious, okay? So it uh, demands more, uh, less time for the other passengers that are not selected, I mean, uh, it's the facilitation of the of all the other uh, passengers to pass through the controls uh, with uh, unnecessary delays. Okay, so you just arrive, and nobody will ask you about your passport, about the purpose of your trip, or whatever. We already make this kind of selection in the system, just receiving. API and PNR system. That's the main stuff that we have here, and what leads us to to make, like I mentioned, it, uh, three hundred percent more seizures than in the beginning. So this is uh, how API and PNR uh, can help us to make a, a, a daily job more easy, not only for the officers that are there, but for the passengers and for the airline companies also, because you have a lot of connections, flight connections, people that, that are uh, delayed for another connection, 
domestic or international doesn't matter because when they are delayed because of a check-in in the security or a big line in the customs, if they lose the flight, the airline company have to pay for this one to relocate the passenger, to pay the meals, to pay the hotels, whatever. And especially for the, uh, for the society, okay? You can have uh, more targets. The accuracy of the targets is, wow, much, much more than the beginning. And for the officers also, for the administration, you don't have to contract a lot of security inspectors or officers or whatever, because we don't have to check all the passengers. We just, we're gonna check those that looks suspicious for us. Uh, and that's why, that's why uh, we developed this system and we also linked this one with the facial recognizement. So from the system the passengers who are selected to be checked to be inspected the picture of the passport will be in the camera system and when this one cross the line in the arrivals area with the bags and searching for for the line nothing to declare the cameras will recognize this one with the facial recognizement recognition system and this one will be automatically selected to the search and this also uh, allows us to uh, minimize the criminal criminal uh, criminality in the airport because uh, we have to take care of the the officers that are there, if you are interviewing and you know someone, you never know if they are linked with the criminal syndicates. We are talking about drugs, for example. So we, are, we, we have to pick, keep in mind about the corruption. So uh, the officer that is there, he never knows who is the one that will be selected. It's also another, another uh, benefit from the API, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you. Um, now we are going to uh, to move to another uh, question related to uh, how can AFSEC benefit from API and PNR? And my second question is for uh, Ali. Um, Ali, could you please tell us from uh, your perspective what are the benefits of API and PNR in terms of strengthening aviation security? Uh, thank you, Narjas. Uh, actually, uh, Anderson gave uh, very good examples of the usage of API and PNR uh, and how they strengthen the aviation security. But uh, using uh, ABI and BNR uh, is important for aviation security and strengthening aviation security because uh, those data give us the possibility to come up with different approach for the screening process as the industry. Uh, and also uh, that it will adopt our security uh, measures to, to uh, current and the future uh, context. Uh, also, uh, the AB and BNR is, is helping the aviation security because the need of the uh, different, different screening becomes more and more apparent and creating for a risk profile for a passenger Passengers is very high basic of this process. Uh, also, uh, using ABI and BNR for uh, string security is evaluating uh, the level of risk uh, posed by creating passenger of flight might determine. At the end uh, of the day, uh, the, conf the configuration of the security uh, development in a certain context. So, uh, based on actual uh, predictions regarding the uh, industry growth and the, as I just mentioned at the beginning, the, the big number of uh, flights and the number of passengers increasing uh, every year, uh, when we factor this uh, and the speed of which uh, the process, the passenger is, is, uh, is gentle and differentiated screening based on uh, AB and VNR will become a, a key element in this uh, equation which will help uh, again the aviation security. Uh, AB and BAR will uh, eventually uh, will eliminate uh, one or more aspects 
of the security uh, measures applied on the, at, the, uh, at the airports, which will have uh, a great effect on the process of, uh, of passengers. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So um, now we are going to move to the biometrics part and uh, to see how can they be integrated into passenger data. Um, in, the, in the first part of our session, we heard from Simon that API and PNR might be uh, combined in the future with biometric data. And my next question is for, for Celine. Celine, can you tell us more about IATA's vision for integrating biometrics uh, into passenger data? And uh, what the roles of the ICAO digital travel credential and IATA's one ID can be in this process? Innovation. <laughs> uh, there are certainly different uh, models, and uh, maybe to um, uh, to set the scene and give a bit more background, um, we've mentioned UN um, Security Council Resolution 2396. It mandates states to collect API data, PNR data, uh, but also to have the capability also to to build a biometric uh, database. So. Uh, Relying on that, uh, there are options, obviously, to uh, think of introducing biometric data into the API and, and have kind of enriched API, um, which I must say uh, might uh, probably not be easy with the uh, network and infrastructure we currently have. Um, but there are also options, and um, I'll, I'll mention uh, once more the TVS system in uh, in US, the Traveler Verification System. Um, we we are looking at it and um, working also with uh, colleagues at CBP to understand uh, how it works and 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 what is uh, I mean w what are the, the options. Um, but there, so the airlines continue transmitting the basic API data to um, um, CBP, sorry, I think, uh, to CBP, uh, to the single window. And CBP creates those galleries of pictures of, of passengers. So they are the one who keep uh, the, the biometric data. Uh, I, I, I was saying that this is a, an interesting model for us, uh, and notably in terms of data privacy. I mean, uh, we know it's it's a concern for you as states, it's a concern for our passengers, but also for our members. Um, they are really careful about what kind of data they can have, how they can transmit it. Um, so um, if countries uh, can build their um, galleries or their um, database of uh, biometric data and we can find triggers, we can find locators to uh, query this data and, and have the match, um, we also think that it's, it's a very good solution. Now, um, we also work with um, ICAO, which is developing the specification for the issuance of the DTC, the Digital Travel Credential, which is uh, an evolution of um, the e-passport. Um, we are not saying that the, the DTC will uh, coexist without the e-passport, but there's uh, certainly a, a progression that, uh, and a phasing of, of the tool that uh, will be implemented through time. Uh, so, as Narges mentioned, it's a digital passport, which is then tokenized. So it's the contrary of the passport, which is a, a, a tokenized a, a paper passport that we then digitalize when we, uh, uh, in the airline process, uh, swap um, the, the machine readable zone, for instance, or when the, the border control agent uh, read the chip. Um, if we have a digital passport, uh, 
could we use this information directly at booking? I was mentioning that uh, the airline is transforming also the, its reservation system uh, to be able to uh, create this uh, one order. Uh, could we introduce these DTC rights at the reservation? What would be the benefits for government? Is it too early for in the process to, uh, to start doing your uh, risk assessment? Um, is it an option? Certainly, uh, we could have introduced, we could introduce the, the uh, p uh, passenger's identity to the required level that border control would need to have uh, way in advance of the uh, airport process and way in advance of the regular checking uh, because currently the, the time when API is created is at the time of checking. Uh, so there are advantages, but you have to keep in mind that uh, the airlines are not there to perform border control or border checks uh, on, on your behalf. So uh, we've been working on this one ID concept, and it's really uh, based on uh, a shared platform, an interaction, a collaboration between governments, airlines, and the airports who need to have some uh, uh, information. Uh, and so the stakeholders get the information they need for their process to the uh, required level of, of security they, they need to perform and to validate uh, their, their um, uh, activities. Um, so you could have, um, if the passenger provides uh, its DTC uh, at the time of booking, the airline would probably just need uh, a name. Um, and as uh, Simon mentioned earlier, uh, the operator does not need to, to have more information on, on the passengers. Um, but on the contrary, the uh, border control would like to uh, have the full information, the image uh, on the passport, maybe the, the second uh, biometrics, if there's one and if it's allowed, uh, but also the security features uh, that are on this DTC. We said the DTC is an evolution of the passport. There are a number of security features on the passport, uh, be them physical, but also uh, certificates and, and seals that gives you as a state a certain level of insurance that uh, the, the, the passport has been issued by the appropriate authority. It has not been tampered with. Um, and, and those security features should be uh, should remain on the TTC. It's part of the, the scope. And you should be able, as a border control, to uh, have the access to those and be confident enough that the information uh, is genuine. Uh, so those are a very um, exciting project. And uh, we don't have... Uh, 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 we cannot say that the, the right now that biometric will be a part of the API plus um, message standard, but there are certainly ways um, to enrich the information you have with uh, uh, more information on the PNR, that will be the order, uh, with more information uh, on the API, if you had uh, also the, the biometric data and some additional uh, security features. Uh, th thank you, Céline. Yes, uh, I, I confirm that uh, effectively the, the digital travel cons uh, cons um Travel credentials, sorry, uh, will be made in uh, in three phases. Meaning that in, t in 2020 we will start with the first phase where we you will be traveling with the digital token and the physical token, and we are working toward uh, a longer term for the rest. Uh, my next uh, question is for Sho. Uh, could you please give us an example of how Narita Airport is using facial recognition to support the concept of one ID advocated by IATA? Thank you, Nadjes. Uh, today, I'd, likely, I'd like to briefly talk about innovative initiative that we, Narita International Airport, takes in terms of enhancing aviation security and making their travel more comfortable. As you can imagine, in my country, Japan, everything is now all set for the upcoming Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. Not only human beings, but also cats and dogs are waiting for the 
national big event. This is true. At the same time, the number of international tourists coming all the way to the Far East Japan has dramatically increased recently, thanks to mainly relaxation of visa requirements for visitors, as well as the increase in the number of international flights. In fact, last year, visitors to Japan recorded more than 30 million, which is almost five times as compared with the year of 2004. Our government has a set a goal to welcome 40 million visitors from the overseas in 2020 next year and 60 million in 2030. When you look at the airport as a gateway of Japan, for instance, airport facility expansion is high on the list as a mid-term or long-term issue. But actually, it's not that so easy. It takes a lot of time. So that's why for our airport, it is essential that we need to ultimately pursue smart operation utilizing innovation. In the environment with some restrictions of limited space inside the airport, lack of human resources that we are now confronting, which may lead to reducing the passengers' processing time and the waiting time, improving terminal handling capacity and the cost effectiveness, as well as better customer satisfaction. As a good example of innovation, I'd like to touch upon the ongoing project of One ID at Nari International Airport, which is called Face Express. It will be in operation in June 2020, starting with Japanese carriers. In addition to that, we are actively working on the introduction of smart security, drastic expansion of security screening checkpoints, and the installation of full automation equipment through all passenger process in the name of faster travel. This is global trend, as you know. So one ID is extremely innovative passenger process using biometric single token at each airport checkpoint, such as check-in, security, and boarding. We aim to develop beyond the models already implemented in other airports. Specifically, we are aiming for walkthrough authentication where the passenger does not have present any documentation and the passenger's identity can be verified while they are on the move. So one ID also brings about the improvement of security, resulting from more precise verification of identity of passenger. It can also be used in detecting questionable credentials. This is a key point for our airport in preventing acts of unlawful interference and terrorism ahead of Olympic Games. When it comes to passenger data exchange, our one ID platform queries airline reservation system using your passport information and boarding pass information and PNR to ensure you are certainly going to fly from Narita Airport today. After that, when your facial photograph image on your passport and the photo that they taking at the airport perfectly match, the facial token will be generated successfully at the time of check-in. So you are ready to fly without any hassle and with higher security. So lastly, uh, we are now very struggling to deal with data privacy issues, to share passengers' personal information safely. We are fully required to comply with the Japan's strictest uh, data privacy protection role in the world, in addition to the European GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that indirectly applied to the airport. 
thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Shu. So we are running really uh, short of time, especially that uh, uh, our interpreters should have uh, stopped already since now five minutes. So I, I have two other questions that I would like to ask you to really answer very quickly. Uh, Ali, could you please uh, tell me Tell us more about the use of biometrics in facilitating the travel of passengers uh, at Hamad International Airport, including the lessons learned, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in Qatar, uh, Hamad International Airport, uh, successfully a trial that, that uh, had been uh, done, started from April for four months, and successfully uh, almost 1,000 uh, passengers registered to this token which is uh, very good to, for, a give, for giving uh, good service for the passengers and which is implement, implementing the facilitation. Uh, also, uh, when giving this uh, opportunity, this benefit for the passenger, asking them to use this uh, kiosk, they will, they will use this because they will have another stage which is, which is using the drop uh, bag, uh, self uh, self drop back which is again using the biometric facial recognitions so uh, after this the passenger also will go through the pre immigration uh, gate which all, all, also if he has missed already this this token this uh, this passenger will has the opportunity to use this uh, gate then the passenger will go direct to the gate without using any identification just uh, again the facial uh, recognitions this is this uh, this system uh, is important because of the collection of uh, information uh, for the for shares and the electronic electronic will be shared with the service providers, and uh, also uh, it it helps implementing the facilitation because it helps speed the process to expedite the flow of passengers, and uh, to, it also uh, give a choice for the passenger to use. <coughs> to use this biometric uh, kiosk to avoid the queuing, to avoid the normal uh, chicken uh, process, and also to avoid the normal bag uh, drop. Uh, also, uh, it's, it's very good to, you can, this biometric kiosk give a chance to use many, many kiosks as, as the space of the airport. Also, this uh, trial improved the system by replacing uh, repetitive chickens, or a chick Chickens by uh, chickens by of passengers and their documentation with the streamlined system, and e also it's a very easy uh, process to uh, to go in from this uh, chaos can take a, a, a picture to match with the passport. Uh, again, this this uh, trial uh, enhanced the customer service and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, my last question is for Celine, and I'm going to ask you to uh, really uh, uh, provide a, a very short answer. Uh, how do you expect one idea to address some of the current issues airlines face, including the inaccuracy of API data transmitted to states? Uh, so, I mean, one of our um, um, motivation also be behind YNID is uh, certainly to um, increase the level of um, uh, data accuracy that governments uh, receive to remove also some of the, the penalties that are imposed on, on airlines. Um, this goes through the uh, automated capture of the passport information as it uh, can be currently done. And uh, we are currently, uh, we have prepared recommendations for our airlines to, to use such systems. Um, but if we uh, introduce the, the DTC, the digital travel credential into um, the uh, the reservation system for um, or um, at at the time of booking or, or later on uh, the information which will be transmitted will be the one uh, which directly comes from the issuing authority uh, thereby uh, you will uh, not have the uh, uh, risk of mistyping uh, passenger information uh, similarly. 
we uh, we hope that an evolution also of the DTC will include uh, travel authorization, like uh, there was the plan also for for the e-passport. So in uh, one to one one digital element, you will have both the travel document, the identity of the passenger, and the travel authorization this person has. So uh, you thereby also reduce the risk of inadmissible, and and the process can be done also automatically from a government perspective perspective on the border control side. Thank you, Céline. Um, now we can go perhaps to look at the results of the uh, audience poll. <coughs> So uh, the question was, which airport process could benefit the most from the use of API and PNR data? Uh, border control, 71%. Security check, 26%. Uh, Check-in and baggage drop-off, 1%. And boarding, 1%. Any comment from uh, our panelists on that? I would say good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, um, and um, uh, that's why the uh, uh, the, um, the the quality of the data is very important for for border control agent because uh, it's very uh, there that um, the data will be used to its full extent to. Uh, uh, yeah. Make risk assessment and and uh, increase thereby the the security and the safety of of the flight. So, thank you, Sidney. Um, I don't know. I don't think that we have time for more questions. So. Um, I, I have promised to make a wrap up, uh, and as we don't have the time, what I am proposing is that uh, I will put uh, the takeaways for each session on the presentations that I have presented, and they would, it will be posted uh, tomorrow. So you will have uh, the wrap up in uh, in writing, I would say, in, in, in the slides. Uh, sorry about that, but we are really uh, out of time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, given the size of the panel, we can double our applause. Well, just a thought, just a thought. Yes. Well, we have the presentation of the reception sponsor this evening, Oral, just outside on your left. And the presentation will be made by Monsieur Daniel Faria. He is Chief Security Officer at Oral. Daniel is a young and accomplished business leader in the information security industry and has been a trusted advisor on cybersecurity to global 500 corporations. He is an MIT graduate and has co-authored papers presented at the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association. So, Daniel, we are very much looking techie. He comes up with his computer and he's making last minute changes and so on. I, I really enjoy that. Daniel, nice to have you here and we're looking forward to your presentation. Sorry. Et voilà. Just to let you know that I have asked you the last question okay. because you have already answered. Uh, bonjour, madame et monsieur. Je m'appelle Daniel Faria. Je suis de sécurité d'Euro. Uh, Aujourd'hui, la présentation sera en anglais. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Ferrier. I'm the Chief Security Officer of Oro. Um, I'm honored to be here in your presence to share with you an innovation story made in Halifax, jointly with Derek Stanford, who is CEO at the St. John Airport in New Brunswick, um, that, contrarily to what has been mostly discussed today, it covers a different topic, which is restricted areas at airports. While most people have been talking about, you know, how can airlines collaborate, how can we all work together, um, we've put together um, a plan and a product that basically uses a combination of bleeding edge technologies, which are composed of artificial intelligence, 
facial recognition, and blockchain. The idea behind this product was based on a problem that we identified. <coughs> um, there is a lack of consistency uh, on and onboarding speed problems in the employee and contractor security screening processes for airport visitors. The biggest issue, um, and this has been extensively discussed uh, today, um, pertains to the insider threat. The insider threat was um, discussed by CNN that the vast majority of the airports in the United States um, have virtually no security um, in terms of restricted areas. They exist, but sometimes it resides on a key card. And the key card, all it takes to steal a key card is um, maybe physical aggression towards a person or um, finding a way to just take possession of the key card. Um, that insider threat uh, has extends to other problems which per are comprised of um, typically a, a, a terrorist can enlist as an employee of the airport. It can go undetected for a long time, and they also can have capabilities to smuggle drugs, weapons, contraband, um, and as they're radicalized, a lot of other bad things can happen. So it's up to each and every airport in several countries, and because this is the UN, we're really talking at a global scale, to commit to strategies and to commit to an innovation perspective that can generate solutions to solve these problems. And I would even like to, to talk to you about um, the, the extensiveness of these problems and as airports become more like cities. Uh, when we think about some airports uh, on an international scale, we're talking about 200,000, 150,000, sometimes even 350,000 people that come on a daily basis to the airport. These people don't necessarily need to be um, your usual security staff. They're contractors, they're somebody that comes to work on real estate. Um, they, they can be doing literally even a server at a restaurant has to go this. So this is an extremely important and, in my opinion, underlooked uh, premise of um, how we're addressing the risk assessment today on airport security. Um, and that also has had consequences. And we all know what happened with 9-11. It's still overlooked. And not that much has changed from a restricted area perspective since then. Um, now, some people have talked about how can blockchain and what, what can this technology do um, in terms of identity verification to ensure that me as a, an employee of an airport that is in charge of security can make sure that the people that are walking through my door have been vetted. And what it does, and uh, quoting the DOD here in the United States, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can stop every breach, but what it means is that suddenly you have a distributed network across um, all continents, like we do, um, at a significantly greater cost to stop uh, the risk of identity theft. And there have been some first movers in very interesting projects. Um, some of these movers are well known. Um, but none of these projects, and there have been some great companies in the, the, the blockchain space, Winding Tree, SkyGrid, Guard Time, that have ranged several, several different applications, but primarily logistics, primarily um, e even business processes of optimization. Um, but the, the security threat has been quite underlooked from a restricted area perspective. So that's why our first partner, uh, the St. John Airport, uh, has taken a risk to actually do something and change the way that security is being um, approached today. Uh, and the benefits were clear. So let's talk about what this airport is. This is a regional air airport. Um, it's actually uh, recognized as the fastest growing airport uh, in Canada. Um, about 
282,000 passengers, and they they were interested for for many many things. Um, the project purpose was to enable authorized airport employees to enter secure areas of the airport, mainly using our terminal to authenticate them as they would be coming to the airport every day. What were, what were the solutions? What are the benefits that we've brought to the table? So, as we know, um, ICAO sets forward standards that can be uh, all, and recommendations on security protocols. So in Canada, for example, there's CATSA that is responsible for regulation on, on, on a lot of these things, but what we've done is we've built a product that can enhance security and provide an extra layer to the rake card in Canada. Um, by doing so, we've installed a process um, that enhances the user journey by adding First, we train the staff of the airport. This staff um, has to understand how to use the system, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, it starts by sign up, then we have an in-person identity verification and onboarding that involves facial recognition, involves verifying a physical piece of ID that contains um, well, th that contains bio biometric data that we then have an algorithm that basically is able to make sure that every aspect of that ID can match other aspects that are also stored in biometric information that we capture from the facial recognition. Then finally, we generate a digital ID. This digital ID is um, stored in the blockchain, and while the blockchain is still um, a new thing that's happening, and a lot of people are still trying to get their um, their hands on and understanding what the value proposition of the blockchain is. The value proposition is very simple. Today, if you have one server, um, and my background being in distributed denial of service and having seen s some very large networks globally, taking one network down is not impossible, and I don't want even to say relatively easy, um, but it is, it is possible. And when you have a blockchain network, what you're creating is, instead of having one single point of failure, you're creating a much broader, much larger uh, system that in order to take down, you would have to build an infrastructure that not only is able to support the distributed network that we are talking about, but it would also have to have the capability to have broken the way the blockchain works, which is or either through a consensus protocol, and that consensus may or may not, depending on what kind of blockchain approach you're, you're having, require 51% of the vote. That means that more than half of the nodes that we've set up to validate the identity are now um, distributed. So, from an air airport installation, we, we obviously uh, started protecting the head office where the CEO works every day um, because it was uh, an easier way to um, get, uh, start, start from a pilot project perspective where we'll be now rolling out to the rest of the airport soon. Um, but the CEO's office today, all they have to do is they come in, they look at the camera, and the door will open. And I would like to show you a video of how the, the product works. Now, in less than one second, we can pull and validate the identity 
over over the entire um, the entire world where we have nodes distributed and we can open the door for you and that's at the end of the day that's i think the the greatest value proposition that we have at oro is we can open the door for you and make sure that we know who we're opening the door at this time thank you very much everybody Merci beaucoup, Daniel. Thank you for a very interesting case study uh, to add to our discussions today and the rest of the week. Well, we're ready for the reception, and thank you as well for the reception, Daniel. Uh, just a few housekeeping items uh, from the day. Don't forget registering for the workshops on the IKEA website. The live screening, of course, is for people from outside to look at and come into the room and share with us the presentations. But of course, these are archived. So if there's a session that was particularly interesting to you today and over the next few days, you can go back and view them again. And again, continue working through the app for networking throughout the three days. So on your behalf, I'd like to thank all of the speakers, moderators, panelists today for a very interesting day. A lot of information, good interaction, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. We get a break, not 9 o'clock, 9.30. So 9.30 tomorrow morning. Have a good reception. See you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>